Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to The Discriminating Gamer. You know, I recently saw a couple of leprechauns having a conversation. It was a lot of small talk. Ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to go ahead and take a look at Banish the Snakes from GMT Games. We'll get back in the review in just a moment. I want to take a minute to ask you to check out my other channel, that is Cody Carlson PhD, where we talk about history, books on history, military history. I even post some of my uh, lectures for my classes on there. Please check that out. Please subscribe to that channel. And now, back to the review. In Banish the Snakes from GMT Games, one to six players take on the roles of various Christian saints as they attempt to convert Ireland from paganism to Christianity during the Dark Ages. Now, in this cooperative game, every player is going to go ahead and take a player board with their matching colored discs as well as pawns, and they are going to also select a saint. Now, there are certain starting saints that you can go ahead and start with um, on, your, on your player board, and more saints will come out as the game progresses. The game board is a map of Ireland during the Dark Ages. Now, you have, of course, the High King, but you also have various uh, kind of regions that have their own kings as well as kind of sub-regions that have chiefs. Now, in addition to their chief, each subregion also has a druid, and the druid is turned upside down, so you don't know what his strength is. You also have various people that are set in every uh, subregion there, and they're all going to be flipped over to their pagan side with a number on it, and that's going to be very important as the game progresses. Now, on a player's turn, what the first thing they're going to do is draw an event card. Now, essentially, you draw an event card from the top of the deck, and then you place it down uh, below. But what's going to happen is you're also going to have the preceding event card next to it, and a special card at the beginning of the game is going to go there. But that preceding card is going to have a essentially an arrow, a colored arrow on it that points to the card you just put out. What that means is you look at the arrow and you look over and you see which event is going to trigger. You go ahead, you resolve that event, whatever it says, then you uh, flip, move uh, that card up, you put the uh, current event card then into that other event card place so that the process will repeat itself during your next phase. After you resolve the event, you can go ahead and move the, uh, the arrow card up, move the event card over, and prepare for when that next card comes out. Now, after you've resolved the event card, you go to the action phase and you take various actions. Now, the whole real point of the game is to try to convert all of the people of Ireland to Christianity. If you can do that, you will win immediately. So what you do is, on your turn, you can take certain actions. First of all, you can move. You can move your pawn one into one adjacent uh, sub-area on the board. Now, if the druid has left, if, if you've been able to defeat the druid, you can go ahead and place a church there, um, kind of a zero-level church, but then, uh, you know, on another turn, you can only do that once per action, so on another turn, or, or somebody else, they could place the next level of church. It goes all the way from a zero-level church to a one, two, and three-level church, and that's going to give you more power when you're attempting to convert people. Now, if you're in a region with someone else, you can give or take a card. You can trade a card for an action. And also, too, some saints may have died. They've got a grave there. You can actually turn that grave into a relic to take with you that, again, will help you during your conversions. But as I say, the game revolves around this process of conversion. Now, what you're doing is, when you are going to convert, you're going to look at certain factors. For instance, um, if you're trying to convert a chief, uh, you look at the chief's negative number, and then you look at the local king's negative number, because the local king influences him. If you're trying to convert a king, you've got to look at the high king's number, because that's going to influence him. Essentially, influence just means you're going to take the number of that uh, uh, 
who's ever doing the influencing and add it to that number of who's ever being influenced. And critically too, your chief is going to influence all the people. But before you can influence anybody in a specific region, you have to get past the druid. Now the druids are all face down, so you don't know what their, what their level is, but you flip them over and you can see kind of what their negative number is. And you're gonna go ahead then and try to beat that. In the case of the people, you would actually have to look at the negative number on the person and then look at the negative number on their chief, add those together, and that's the negative number you have to overcome. But essentially, as you're looking at all these negative numbers, there are positive numbers that you can bring to it. Some, sta some saints just have a positive one to conversion. Uh, if you're carrying you know, a relic or there's a grave there or something, then you, you get another one. If you have churches, depending on its level, one, two, or three, you get that number of, of positive modifiers. And there's other positive modifiers you can add. Well, you go ahead and you look at your board and you kind of, kind of move a, a disc to show exactly what the number is that you have to beat. Now, critically, before you actually convert, you can spend actions to prepare. Now, if you prepare for each prepare action you take, you gain a plus one to your die roll and you can move that uh, disc along the track of the appropriate place. Now, for, your, for that final action on there, you have to go ahead and uh, use that to roll for the conversion. You go ahead, you roll the die, and if the die is greater than the number on your track, then you've converted. You can flip that person from its pagan side to its Christian side. However, if you get it uh, equal, if you match it, then you don't get to flip it over, but you have nothing bad happens to you. However, if you do roll and it's lower than that number, then you take a hit on your zeal track. Now, your zeal track is kind of like your health. It also determines how many actions you get in a round. As it get, goes down and down, you're going to get fewer and fewer actions. But you go ahead and you use that to kind of measure your actions and your health in the game. Now, as you play the game and your zeal goes down, once your zeal gets down to the bottom of the uh, zeal track, uh, on that last space, you can make a final effort. A final effort actually increases your chances by two to make a conversion, um, and it it's, will lead to, to your death. You don't have to take it there, but you can. Now, you will die occasionally in this game. That is to say, your priest will, your, your saint will. When that happens, um, over the course of the game, as you're getting other events and other things are happening, you may gain other saints. And these saints you can kind of essentially put in your keep area at the bottom of your board. If your uh, saint dies, you essentially replace him with the new saint. You put a grave marker where he died, and you get your new saint out there, and, and whatever characteristics he has then apply to, uh, to, to, to how you approach the game. Now... If you die and you don't have another saint ready, you flip your board over to its acolyte. Your acolyte is considerably weaker. Your acolyte does not have any special um, abilities, but if you do get a saint card, you can flip it back and put the saint on there. If ever an acolyte dies, if ever an acolyte gets all the way to the bottom of their zeal track and they die and they don't have a saint to put on there, then the game is immediately over. Now, as all of this is going on, you have kind of this Britain track off to the side. And the Britain track essentially is slowly giving up Roman Christianity as it was practiced, and they're embracing paganism. So Rome, uh, uh, England is becoming more and more pagan. As this is going down, different cards are kind of unlocked and they're going to go into the, into the draw deck, um, and, and other funky things may happen. Now, if ever that, uh, that, that track ever gets all the way down to the very bottom and Britain completely becomes pagan, then the game is immediately over. So that's basically it. There's a little bit more going around here, but basically uh, players are going around and around. They are drawing saints. They are moving to different locations. They are trying to convert the various levels of society in those locations. They're making those conversion attempts, and sometimes they're dying. They're replacing themselves with other saints or with other acolytes. They're going around and around trying to convert the people of Ireland. Now, if ever at any time you succeed in, in, in converting all of the people in Ireland to Christianity, you immediately win the game. As I say, if ever an acolyte dies, if ever the, the, the paganism marker gets all the way to the Britain track, or if ever the draw deck goes out, then those factors will end the game, and you immediately go to scoring. For scoring, you're going to go around, you're going to look at all of everyone you have converted. You're going to look at the people, the, the chiefs, the kings, and the high kings. You're going to add up and see how many points you get for each of those uh, people that you have converted to Christianity. Now, if you get between zero and six and a half uh, points, it is a total defeat. If you get between seven and twelve and a half points, it is a partial defeat. If you get between thirteen and eighteen uh, and a half points, I believe it is a partial victory. If you get more than nineteen points, then you have won a full victory, and you and your friends collectively win. Banish the snakes.
Well, Banish the Snakes. This is a game that uh, somebody had heard about, and I started looking into it, and then as I was looking into it, I got a package from GMT Games, and this game was in it. And so um, I'm always excited when I get something from GMT because, you know, more often than not, they're very, very good quality games. So I got this game out and looked at it, and it looked very interesting, although you do have to do stickering, which I'm not a fan of. But I got all the stickers on there. And it took a couple of weeks to get this to the table. And uh, we'd actually planned it a few times, and plans had fallen through and whatnot. And uh, we went ahead and we, we got together and we played it with a four-player. And the game, um, that first game, is is very interesting. It's a very interesting system of, of course, um, you know, having these kind of random events, but then you, you and your friends are maneuvering to convert through this dice rolling system, all of these people in Ireland. And really at the heart of the game, it's almost kind of a dice manipulation game. That is to say you're manipulating the, the DRMs. You're doing everything again to get positive DRMs while you're facing sometimes these seemingly overwhelming negative DRMs. So that's kind of a big deal. That is a very big deal here. Now I gotta say, I really like the card system, the event card system. I like how you pull it out and the preceding card has an arrow pointing to which which uh, event that takes place. That was really fun. That was really interesting, I thought, and I really liked the way that that worked. Uh, also, I too, I, I like how you've got kind of the ticking clock with the um, paganism card moving further and further down the Britain track. That too, I thought was just really a lot of fun. Um, I... I the game itself is actually a fairly simple game. Like I say, you just got really a few actions. And most of the time, what you're trying to do, as I say, is manipulate your, your, your DRMs. So we went ahead, uh, we played this, and we really enjoyed it. it. It was really a lot of fun. I think I probably liked it a little bit better than some of my friends did. My, all, everybody that played it said they liked it, so they had fun with it. But they were kind of on the fence. I don't know if I'd buy this game or whatnot. But I got to tell you, I, I really got a kick out of it. However, I will say this. We played that, that initial game as a four-player game. And I'll tell you this, the game, I have not yet played it solo. I really get the impression the game probably hums as a solo game. I really think it it just seems like it'd move a little quicker. Um, there wouldn't be as much downtime. And you can, um, I mean, it just feels, it feels like it's a solitaire game. That's to me what it feels like. And it's big enough that you can play it with, with other people. And I enjoyed it with my friends. But I get a sense that it probably would work a little bit better as a solitaire game. And I and I, and I wanted to go ahead and get my thoughts out here now. Um, I may play solitaire here before too long. But I wanted to do this review right now because I felt like, uh, like I said, I, I had some very distinct impressions of it. And I wanted to get those out right now. Long story short, I like this game. I think it's a fantastic game. I think, like I say, if a lower player count or even, even solitaire, I think my, my gut is it would probably work better. But with four, I liked it. And it was fun. It was engaging. But bear in mind, it is pretty much a game. It almost at times felt a little abstract. Um, overall, the theme does come through. The theme does come through. But there are times when you're just doing the mathy stuff when you're thinking it, it kind of loses a little of the theme. But then the theme reaches around and pulls you back into it. Um, overall, really, really enjoyed uh, uh, Banish the Snakes. Recommendation for the discriminating gamer for Banish the Snakes is buy it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you once again for joining us today on The Discriminating Gamer. As always, we ask you to please leave a comment for us on YouTube, on Board Game Geek, on our Facebook page, or on thediscriminatinggamer.com. We ask you to please like us here on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and follow us on Twitter. I'd also ask you, ladies and gentlemen, to, if you if you really enjoyed this uh, video and you like the channel, go ahead and click on the Super Thanks button here on your screen. That will help us out a lot as well. Also, I'd ask you to please check out my other channel. That is Cody Carlson PhD, where we talk about military history and books on history. I'm currently uploading my lectures for World War II on that channel. Uh, I would really appreciate it if you would subscribe to that channel as well. And please give us a thumb on Board Game Geek. That helps us out a lot. You know, ladies and gentlemen, I'm reminded of a story about an Irishman. And every day he would go into the same uh, pub and he would order three whiskeys. He'd drink them down in quick succession and then he'd leave. Well, he keeps doing this day in and day out. Finally, the bartender asks him, he says, why do you always do that? Why do you come in? Why do you order three whiskeys uh, drink him down, and then leave. And he says, well, you see, I've got a brother, and I've got a brother in uh, in America, and I've got a brother in Australia, and I come in here, and I take the uh, take the drink for each of them. It feels like they're right here with me every day. Barker says, oh, well, that makes sense. Well, a few weeks go by, and the guy comes in, and surprisingly, he order only orders two whiskeys, and he drinks them down. And the bartender, feeling a sense of, uh, you know, compassion, says, Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. Uh, which brother did you lose, the one in America or the one in Australia? And he says, Oh no, it's nothing like that. You see, I've given up drinking.
and your life's work will have been meaningless. No. <laughs> <laughs>